some of the really famous bodybuilders, pictures of them while they're taking steroids and then pictures of them after, after they stop. It's not even like you're looking at the same person. My focus is on lifetime fitness. And if you want lifetime fitness, steroids or be in most cases testosterone replacement is not the way to go welcome to corporate warrior the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health optimize performance and maximize productivity with your host lawrence neal this podcast is brought to you by hituni.com Hit Uni are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. Hit Uni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carson, and trainer Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer Simon Shawcross. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, and Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing and the courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention that there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regimen. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I.com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, that's hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10. Thank you for your support. Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior with your host Lawrence Neal. This podcast is my obsessive hunt to understand how to optimize productivity in health, career, business and lifestyle. My guests include health and fitness giants, underground rarely interviewed exercise experts, hit specialists, athletes, New York Times best-selling authors, highly successful business owners, startup founders, life hackers, etc, etc. Next guest is the well-revered and exercise legend Clarence Bass. In 1994, and after a successful career in law, Clarence decided to turn his focus to full-time writing on health and fitness. However, that was not the beginning. Clarence has been a devoted health and fitness enthusiast his entire life. He started out in Olympic weightlifting where he won many local and national awards. At 40, Clarence turned his attention to bodybuilding. He won his high class past 40 Mr. America in 1978 and the past 40 Mr. USA the following year. More recently, Clarence, now in his 80s and still in fantastic shape, has focused on activities that require both strength and endurance like indoor rowing and has ranked highly in different age brackets across the last few few decades. Clarence has catalogued his entire health and fitness journey and he has a web page of wonderful pictures taken of his physique in every decade from when he was a teenager. Furthermore, Clarence has written many highly valuable and popular articles and books on how to optimize all-round health and fitness for life. In 2003, Clarence was awarded the most prestigious award from the Association of Old-Time Barbell and Strongmen, the Vic Boff Award for Lifetime Achievement. In essence, Clarence is an absolute legend and a role model for anyone looking to learn how to build and maintain excellent health over the long term. This was a real treat and pleasure for me. I'm a big fan of Clarence, but not as big as some of you, I found out. And I was blown away by the number of questions that you asked me to ask him. And I didn't let you down. And I asked as many as possible. And to be fair, your questions were world class. Some of the topics we get into include how Clarence obtained his best physique, looking back, what he thinks was most effective and ineffective and what worked against him. 
Knowing what he knows now, would Clarence have migrated to his current infrequent routine sooner? Clarence talks about his mentor and inspiration. We dig into his current exercise and diet protocols in a lot of detail. We discuss the logic and reason that drives this current program. We discuss his latest views on diet and how one should eat for optimal body composition and health, including his views and experiences trying low carb and his thoughts on things like intermittent fasting and much, much more. For the show notes for this episode and all episodes, please go to 15minutescorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. That's 1515. Now, it did take me 10 to 15 minutes to warm up. I was a little nervous, uh, so please be patient because I actually believe this is one of my best podcasts to date and there are some absolute gems to be discovered throughout. Some of the stuff that Clarence shares is some of the best advice I've ever heard and I think anyone could do well just listening to this podcast and really absorbing very little else when it comes to uh, health, fitness and diet. He was an absolute joy to talk to and I'm honoured that he would take the time to come onto my show. So without further ado, please enjoy this wide ranging conversation with the one and only Clarence Bass. Clarence, welcome to the show. Welcome to Corporate Warrior. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Um, I wanted to just kick off with some questions around exercise. Uh, so in your, in your, I know you wrote uh, three versions of Ripped, uh, your book there. Um, you describe how you used a split routine combined with long bike rides to build your physique at the time. Um, do you think that that routine made a huge difference or do you think that you could have trained then like you do now and achieve the same outcomes? Well, my, my training format has kind of changed over the years. I've been training for about 65 years now, so obviously it has changed. Uh, I think what I'm doing now might have been more efficient than what I was doing then, but the uh, the, the split routine plus the bike uh, gave me fantastic results. That's uh, you, you may have read in Ripped how Loveless Medical Center, a big uh, research center here in Albuquerque, they were doing testing on on the astronauts, called me up, and and one of the things they tested was my my body fat level, and my body fat level was two point four. Wow. <laughs> so it's really working. I, I don't think you can argue with the success of it. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And that is a, 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 I do, I do remember that. And that is a very low body fat percentage indeed. Um, but do you think that if you were to go back to then and use the same protocols that you use now, are you saying that your results would be suboptimal, that you wouldn't have achieved the same, do you think? Oh, I think I would have achieved just, just as just as much or maybe more because i'd have more focus on on intensity and on uh you know getting enough rest uh, i was i was influenced then like everybody else by what the the programs the routines that you were reading in the magazines and almost everybody all the bodybuilders were doing high volume so i started out as i explained there and ripped with a relatively high volume but as time went on and as explained in that book and also through the the whole series uh i became more focused on intensity and i think in, i think with your boil training down that 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 challenge to your system overload plus rest are the the key elements in, in any system but there's many many different ways to do that how do you when you talk about overload how do you define that overload is pushing your body a little harder than it's used to being pushed so you have to give your body a reason to improve if you don't push it and the, the, the body is lazy if, if all you do is uh is lift a teacup the body is going to uh, prepare muscles to lift a teacup but not more <laughs> because they're saving the body is saving its re resources so you have to push yourself. You have to give the body a reason to get stronger or bigger. Uh, but you, you have to do it in a uh, in a in a reasonable way. You have to just a little bit at a time, and then you have to rest to let your body adapt. So it's really pretty simple. There's many different ways to do it. Uh, obviously, what I did there in Ripped worked, and I and I changed, but I changed what I was doing 
to go from less volume to more intensity and more rest over the course of, of the period covered by that first book. That's interesting. Um, I wonder if uh, this, you might have already answered this question away. Um, was the, the, uh, the condition that you just described, was that when you were at your prime, your, your peak look, would you say? <clears throat> Frankly, I think I look best ever when I was 60. Really? It would sound strange, but I, I have a, an article on our website called uh, Waterlogged in Atlanta. And, and I have pictures of me at the time uh, uh, covered by ripped. And then I have pictures again at 60. And I think I look better at 60. I mean, it might have been <laughs> not quite as lean, but but I, w- I had a more fuller uh, look. So I, ha- I have those pictures at, at, at both periods of time. Um, and so, so the, the pictures taken at 60 are really my, my all-time favorite. What um what do you remember what workout protocol and diet you were following at that time when you felt you looked your best? Well, I think for one thing, I understood that you could eat more and not be so uh, so focused on counting calories. Uh, and I think I probably was training with more intensity then. Uh, each one of my books kind of covers a different time in my life. So Challenge Yourself uh, is my age 60 book, and that's where I first started talking about one weight workout and one aerobic workout uh, in the course of a week. Uh, So that's pretty much what I was doing then. It was more focused on uh, on intensity and rest than it was when when I wrote the RIP series. Yeah, no, and you've uh, you're prolific in your work, and you've obviously wrote a lot of books and uh, have a lot of content on your website, which is all very, very, very helpful. Um, and I'll be sure to link to all of it in my show notes. I, I, I've written ten books, and I tried <laughs> not to write the same book over again. So each book covers kind of a different stage stage in my life. And on our website, we have ten different categories and. Uh, I'm now working on, on article number 445. Wow. So there's tremendous volume of information there, but the, the new stuff keeps coming out, and I've never uh, I, I've never wanted for something new to write about, which is rather amazing, But and it's coming out back even faster now than ever before. Yeah, I, I read, I read a, a, obviously I've read some of your, your work, um, you know, over the over the months and years uh, and more recently in preparation for this i've read a, a few articles which we'll come on to um but a lot of my listeners were very insistent on that i read your books and i must admit i've um i've, I've not managed to which i'm a bit ash- embarrassed to say um but perhaps i can set some time aside to read some of those um and maybe we could do a round two who knows and we could get into some of that but i think my my audience have been very very helpful because they, they they know more about you you than i do uh, and they've supplied me with some some great questions to ask you um so i was wondering you know l- looking back at your sort of training career and training life would you leave out anything if you had the chance to do it over again were there anything i mean you mentioned you were doing much more high volume is there anything that comes to mind that you would have left out looking back well i I, in ripped i talked about trying the low carb diet because that's what everybody in the magazine was was doing and i I explained there that it didn't work for me i couldn't think i couldn't couldn't train right just nothing was working right there was a section in Rip. You know, I gather Rip probably is one of the books you've read yeah. called Dr. Jill and Mr. Hyde, where I was just in a practically a stoop. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned how you were. Uh, about, about that. So I, and I had two nectarines with me, and I ate those nectarines, and I just, it was like, like night and day. I felt great all over again. So that kind of convinced me that I needed carbs. So I guess. Maybe I would have liked to have skipped that, but really it was a learning experience. It was very intense. It was very clear, and I've never gone back to the low carbs. You need carbs. They should be healthy carbs, not refined carbs, but you need carbs to think and act and 
uh, live properly. What healthy carbs do you recommend? Is it looking at um, looking at one sort of diet a diagram you you had on your website? Um, is it sort of you, you referring to kind of fruits and vegetables and beans that type of thing? Yes, I think you're talking uh, about the milk in the middle article. That, Correct. That, that diagram, that, that's the best thing I've ever seen. I think everybody should have that on the refrigerator because it just explain, <laughs> explains uh, uh, what a healthy, balanced diet is. But it, it's not complicated about the carbs. It, it's food, the whole foods, the foods, the way they come in nature without the without the, the, the the fiber taken out or without sugar added, the way it comes in nature, almost all foods, if you eat them the way they come in nature, they're not going to make you fat because you get full before you eat too much. And it's the refined carbohydrates. Those are bad because they shoot your blood sugar up and then you have a, a rebound the other way and then you're hungry again. But if you eat the whole foods, uh, carbohydrates, uh, I'm so sorry, fiber, fruit, vegetables, that type of thing focus on that it's almost impossible to overeat that's interesting so you you mentioned there in your diagram you've got whole grains there in the uh the the healthier section um and obviously you've got a lot of people that believe that you know whole grains and a high carb hydrate based diet you know regardless of the carb whether it's you know sugar or rice or bread you know causes you to spike insulin and store body fat and obviously this is a, a highly debated topic uh, and you've said just then that you felt that carb a very low carb diet made you feel really bad so what, what's your view on what's your thoughts on that well i don't think it's very highly debated by people who know what they're talking about <laughs> <laughs> that, that that eating whole foods and, and of course you should also have have fat in your diet and have protein in your diet and, and that all that makes the food stay in your stomach longer but it's the combination of the whole food carbohydrates the the protein and the fat and if you eat that balance uh, it, it, it slows down the digestion it, it have you it keeps your blood sugar on an even keel um, so uh, I don't think there's any argument that that you well there is obviously um, but and, and if you just eat carbohydrates Without the protein or the fat, your blood sugar would go up quicker. So it's, you need the balance right. in your diet. Good. Okay. So just um, jumping back a second to exercise, I sort of jumped ahead into the uh, nutrition questions. Um, what were some of the biggest mistakes you feel you made in your training and lifestyle? So aside from the low carb uh, approach, which didn't work for you, um, what were some of the biggest mistakes that you made in your training, which you kind of try and steer people away from uh, people who are perhaps just getting into training? Well, when people are just getting into training, I, I think they try to make it too complicated I got an email from a fellow who's just getting back to training when he was 63 and asked me, should he, should he use free weights or, or machines? And, you know, that's, it kind of depends on what's available to you and what you enjoy. Probably a combination is best, but, but, it, but it's, it, it, it's not that precise. It's what almost anything will work as long as you have the overload and you remember that rest is very important. Overload doesn't work unless you give your body time to, to recover and, and, and adapt. So uh, nothing really jumps out at me about m m mistakes in training. I think when I started out there, returning to bodybuilding competition, going high volume, but, but I learned, and I think that's why people like RIP so much rips rip we still sell rip every it, it, every week <laughs> and it, it was written in 1980 that's amazing um, I'm glad that it has this backup with the with the body composition testing so i was a, 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 able to, to 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 measure my results in, a, in an objective positive way so if things weren't working and also going by how i felt um so the too much volume there that that's probably one of the biggest mistakes 
on diet, the, the biggest mistake was everybody thought until recently the, the the guidelines for Americans had restrictions on 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 fat, and and those restrictions have been removed. And it's just like the the carbohydrates they come back to eating healthy fats. Uh, it's not processed fats, but fats the way they come in food uh, and the omega threes. Uh, and that type of thing, and I, I when I when I learned that uh, that the importance of the the, the the thinking, even the doctor would say, yeah, just eliminate all the fat in your diet that you possibly can. That's wrong, and not only from a health standpoint, but from the standpoint of of controlling your body weight. You, as I said before, you need you need the fat in your diet to make the food stay stay in your uh, in your stomach longer and, and not shoot up your blood sugar it also has a positive effect on on your on your cholesterol and your triglycerides uh, but by kind of by accident I started adding a little bit of vegetable oil to each one of my meals and my idea was to make the food stay in my stomach a little bit longer uh, so I would stay satisfied longer but I just happened to have my triglycerides checked at about that same time. And adding that little bit of fat cut my triglycerides from 150 to 75, cut them in half. Wow. So that, that drove home to me that that, that that really was an important part of your diet. And that's when the, the, all the talk about omega-3 fats, uh, which is mainly found in fish, came out so that, that that that's been a big change there that was certainly a mistake that i was making but almost everybody was making the same mistake how do you measure your body composition now so first how do you measure it and how regularly do you measure it i well when i started out i would i, would, I had to go down and have myself weighed underwater hydrostatic weighing which is still the the uh, the gold standard but it's a lot of trouble to set up the yeah. underwater thing, and you have to pay a lot for it now. But now they have scales out that they have the Tanita body composition scale, uh, which it, it passes a current through your body, and the electric, it's very small current, but it goes through uh, it goes through the muscle faster because muscle is mainly water, and again it goes slower through the fat. So. I'm, I weigh myself every Saturday morning on, on my t- to meet the scale, which gives my weight, my body fat level, how much uh, my hydration, which is very important, and and what what the formula says your 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 fat is, uh, and so that allows me to keep track of what I, what I'm doing. If you came to my house, I could show you my weekly weight record going back to 1990. <laughs> I really do. I probably could find it before that, but this these scales have come out, and the scales tell you so much more that your your, uh, your bathroom scale is almost worthless because you you can weigh the same, but you could could be losing muscle and gaining fat. And bathroom scale would say no, nothing had changed. Exactly. So this also by using the body composition scale. It, it 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 gives you feedback on if you're if you're eating a certain thing or or maybe you got some excess sodium what that does to your diet because it shows up on that on that scale so and, and another thing about that is people they get all excited and they think gee I want to weigh every day it's not a good idea to weigh every day because your everybody's their their activity level and their diet changes a little bit over the course of the uh, uh, of the week so if, to make the scale accurate you have to weigh at the same time so i weigh saturday morning when i get up get up go to the bathroom and weigh so you then then, I, then i'm comparing with the next time with with the next uh, the next saturday so you have a nice have a nice trend if you're doing that every day drive yourself nuts because it's just going up and down and and it would make no sense at all so as long as you're consistent with how you use that to need to scale it gives you a a a consistent result 
Now, it may not be quite as accurate as underwater weighing, but it is consistent in doing what it does. So if you use it consistently, it will consistently tell you whether you're going up or down, you're changing. In my case, ideally, I want, would like it to stay about the same, which it does. That's a really good point, because like you say, these devices, they're not anywhere well they're not as accurate as you know the way in uh, the underwater way in or maybe a, a dexa or a bod pod or a device like that um, but it doesn't matter so long as you're using the same tool you can see how it's changing for good or bad that's um, exactly right you want to see hmm. how your body is, is changing up or down in response to what you're doing and then if you change you can you can see on the scale whether it whether it changed your result it's very very helpful it's very important to understand how the scale works. Uh, it comes with a nice little booklet, and if you really spend time on the booklet, understanding what uh, what what the scale, how it how it works, then you can analyze and understand the results and learn much more from using it. What is the mod- What is the brand or the model of the scale you use? I know you mentioned it. Could you just repeat that? And the, Tanita, T-A-N-I-T-A, and the one I used is the uh, CP-533. And I've had that scale for about 10 years, so there may be another version of that, but that's worked extremely. It's just been a wonderful scale. Body, BC, body, compos- body composition, 533. Uh, you could buy that on, on Amazon, or, or you could just... Uh, Type in Tanita scale on on Google, and you'll it's sold all over the world. I'm going to buy one. I think <laughs> you've sold me. I think it's maybe about a hundred and fifty dollars or something. Oh, really? But well, maybe not then. <laughs> No, it sounds like a very good investment. Um, okay, so um, going back to, I guess, some of the things that you attribute to your best condition, and you've been, throughout your career, you've been very transparent and honest about steroid use and stuff like that. Um, and I just wondered that, how much do you attribute your best condition to things other than your genetics and diet and training, such as steroids and supplements? Well, that's an interesting thing about the age 60 photos, because I had not used photos for several uh, photos, uh, steroids for several decades when when, when those photos were taken. That's why it's so amazing. You can look at the photos where I was taking steroids, as I explained in Ripped, and compare. And I may have been a little bit leaner looking there, but I think overall I look better at 60. And over the course of time, if, if you look online, some of the really famous bodybuilders, pictures of them while they're taking steroids and then pictures of them after after they stop, it's just, it's not even like you're looking at the same person. So if my thinking, and that's what I tried to explain in RIPT and in, in, in RIPT 2, that if you're, my focus is on lifetime fitness. And if you want lifetime fitness, steroids or be, in most cases, testosterone replacement is not the way to go because it's an up and down, up and down thing. And you don't want to have up and down. I explained and ripped what happened when I stopped taking the steroids. So I, people criticize me for taking steroids. And, and I tell them if they will look, read ripped carefully, they'll see that it's, it, it's the best thing at that time and maybe ever explaining why you should not take steroids because you can't keep taking them and if you stop you lose everything you let you gained or a lot of it and then your your natural testosterone production is suppressed for a while so then you're at a disadvantage you're you're going to gain fat because you don't have the the natural testosterone production so uh, you get just it's up and down and if you're going to train uh, with an idea towards being fit for life, which is my my focus, it's simply not the way to go. And if you if you train regularly, your your testosterone level, at least in my case, has not gone down. It's been level for I don't know about twenty years, the period that I've been getting it tested at the Cooper Clinic. So I think that people ask me how how what's the best way to raise their 
their testosterone and they're thinking I'm going to tell them some kind of a pill or a drug and I'm telling them it's regular exercise. That is, that is really interesting and really good advice. Um, when you did do steroids, how long did you do them for? And have you had any thing in the way of long-term effects uh, long-term sort of negative effects or were you not doing them long enough to really have any of those i, I don't think i've had any long-term effects or none that i'm aware of mm, okay um okay so on that vein as i said you've been very honest about you know health issues and mm. things like um hip replacement and other things um with that in mind is there anything you would have done differently to avoid those issues so do you think that they were a result of maybe training in in an in the wrong way uh, or do you think they just happened and there is very little you could do about that I'm not sure I understand that question. What are you focusing on now? The steroids? Oh, no, sorry. So um, I'm talking about uh, things like, you know, your, your hip replacement that you mentioned. Um, and I guess any other health issues you've, you've had uh, or, or, or continue to have, um, whether or not they've been, you feel they've been caused by training habits in the past that you kind of regret and wish you hadn't trained in a certain way um, or whether they were just happened organically, they would have happened anyway. I had my right hip replaced about a decade ago, uh, and and of course the doctors you ask them what what caused it, they can't tell you. But I, I have a genetic curvature in my in my back. My my mother had the same thing, and I think the reason that I that that my right hip wore, wore out was because there was an uneven stress there. And my feeling is that had I not been training, training, of course, develops all of the muscles around the hip. So it gives the hip support. If I didn't have those muscles, I think I would have uh, probably needed that hip replacement uh, sooner than I did. And as I told you before this, uh, before we're doing this, this podcast, mm. Uh, I'm getting ready to have my my left hip replaced. It's been a ten year gap, and I think it's the same thing. It's the kind of the uneven uh, wearing out. But my right hip seems to have worn out a lot quicker than my left hip, uh, and uh, I, I say again, I think they would have both worn out a long time before they did had I not been training and particularly with the muscles in my lower back, my hips, um, just my core, the muscles that are supporting the, uh, supporting your, your, your hip. Hmm. I don't think I made any mistake there. I think I did well. Yeah. That's how I explain it. People ask me about that because they're, they're trying to get me to say that lifting caused me to my hip to wear out. And I think to the contrary, hip exercise, strength training for those muscles made the hip last longer than it would have otherwise. I can't prove it, but that's what I believe. Yeah, how irritating, because I agree with you. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to prove, though, isn't it? And it must get kind of irritating for you when people say that because they probably have that bias don't they because they don't strength train or don't believe in strength training yes well there's a lot of a lot of things going on there and i think people that they should be developing those muscles uh and and, and i in my i the, the book where i talk about my my hip replacement is great expectations but I've also written an article online called Miracle in Houston, uh, which has been out for over a decade. I still get feedback on that because I explained that that I uh, that I, I I insisted on using something called the anterior approach. It's a frontal approach where they they go in between muscles, so they don't have to detach the muscles. The traditional way is to go in from posterior, go in through your butt. I didn't want any doctor, any surgeon cutting the muscles in my butt. I spent too much time developing those muscles in my butt. But anyway, that made recovery come very fast. So that's that that uh, uh, that article has gotten a lot of attention. And 
And I, I had to go to Houston because nobody was doing that here in, in New Mexico. This time around, I found someone that is doing uh, that surgery in Albuquerque. And I've just written a, an article about that, which will come out with our April 1 update because it was it was quite a chore to find someone really experienced you need to it's a little more complicated there's a little there's a high steeper learning curve uh, to do it and also it requires a special table which positions your legs so they can visualize what they're doing so it's a little more complicated and uh, anyway it's a good story so I, I I think people will will enjoy reading about my search for the for the surgeon here, and uh, we think we found the right one. We're going to know here pretty soon. April is. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it sounds really interesting, and I, I think that article will come out just uh, near around the time this goes live. So, I'll be sure to link to it from the blog post. Great. Yeah. it'll be out with our. We we update the website on the first of every month, so it will be out April April first good stuff no wiggle. that's when it'll be there cool um Clarence, are there any athletes or writers or i suppose health and fitness experts that you respect and admire and follow regularly these days well my my long-term favorite and role model is bill pearl uh bill pearl I think it must be about 84 now, but he still gets up at four o'clock in the morning to train. He, I think he trains a little bit too much, but my dad and I attended uh, our first national weightlifting championship, and they held, held the Mister America at that time in conjunction with the with the weightlifting. And Bill Pearl won the Mister America. That's the first time I had seen him, but I've kind of followed him all the way through. And he, he has always stayed in shape, and he has contributed. He's written a wonderful uh, book. Uh, I can't think of the name. Uh, something about the universe, where he, he covers, it's about 500 pages long, and he covers exercises for each body part. I think there's 90, 90 pages on just training the triceps. Oh, wow. It's ridiculous, but it's very <laughs> instructive, and it just shows how methodical he is and then more recently he's come out with a with a three volume series covering the history of of physical culture going way back to the to the romans uh, and it covers everybody uh every famous or well-known person i was so happy to, to be included in that in that volume um uh, <laughs> I can't think of the name of the series right now, but if you go uh, to BillPearl.com, his website, you'll, you'll, you'll see it immediately. But it, and, it, and he's also written a wonderful uh, autobiography. It's, uh, there's not many autobiographies written by big-time bodybuilders, but I th thought his is, is called Beyond the Universe. Um, so he's somebody that not only has maintained, he was kind of the Arnold Schwarzenegger of his time, just... I remember seeing him. He was the, the most, not necessarily at that Mr. America 53, but a few years later when he put on more masks, he was the most impressive. Just standing there, you, just, you couldn't believe that somebody could have so much muscle and look so powerful just standing there. But, he's, but he stayed in shape his whole life, and, uh, and he's given back. So he's, he's definitely my all-time favorite role model mm -hmm. yeah i'll be sure to to find his uh his stuff and, and link to it um what is the most important thing that you feel you've learned over all your years of training and what's been the most interesting well the, th the thing that i've come to realize more and more is that the most important thing is regular training and people that they try to make training too complicated and and the, what the thing to realize is that the only training that's going to work 
is something that you that you enjoy, probably something that you're good at, and that you'll keep doing. If you won't keep doing it, nothing's going to work. So that, that that is the key thing to find something that fits in your lifestyle. I, I knew right away that I that I was not an endurance athlete. I'm more of a strength athlete. So my focus has been on um, on resistance training, but I have gotten more into uh, into aerobic training, the high intensity intervals. So I think there does need to be a balance. But but that's the key. The best the, it's, the the key thing is to keep training on a regular basis. And of course, you have to stay motivated. So that's that's a big a big problem. And that I I wrote about in my first book. Not in my book, Lean for Life, which was the first book where I talked about a balance between strength and aerobics. And there's a very good section about motivation. And the biggest motivator is progress. If, if, if you don't progress, you lose interest. But if you can, you can see yourself making progress from workout to workout, you stay motivated. And so what I try to do is to make some, it's mighty hard to do after you've been training as long as I have, but find some little thing, some way to, to improve. So the first thing I do when I'm sitting down to train, I, I look at my training diary. I see when I did this workout last, what did I do? And then I try to figure out some little way that I can improve. So I try to improve in every workout. And if you work it right, you, you can do that. And also, if you top out on something, like when I when I started in my early years on Olympic lifting, and I was very successful in Olympic lifting, but when I got to be about 35, I felt that I pretty much achieved all I was going to achieve. But then I looked around for something else that where I could improve, and that's when I turned to bodybuilding because I knew that uh, that I could improve my my physique. Uh, and so I, that was a way to, to improve further. I, so I was with bodybuilding, focused on that for a long time. I've, I've stayed focused on that, but I've added things like uh, like indoor rowing. So that's another thing where you can measure your progress. Um, so <laughs> I, 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 I got to talking so much, I kind of forgot what the question was. No, no you answered it excellently. Um, and I was going to probe a little bit on that because... I think it's it's very difficult from a if you're just looking at the resistance training workout so just you know lifting lifting uh, weights it's quite obviously there comes a point where your strength gains are incredibly marginal if non-existent um and, and i noticed from from your from reading your stuff that you'll often have some sort of skill-based goal like rowing or something similar so is, is that is that fair to say that you know that it's there comes a point in terms of the strength training side of things where you know the it's really difficult to find an area where one can improve in that particular workout you have to almost well, that, that's true but it kind of depends on how you look at that that you can always change and ex- change exercises so if you change exercises you can probably improve and then when you stop improving there you change again so you have to be right. be thoughtful and a little bit imaginative about how to adjust the workout so you can find something. There's always some change. If you're going to you plan to do a new exercise or an exercise you haven't done for a long period of time, that that makes it more exciting. Or you really want to you know, want to get back to trying that again, and you will improve for a while. So if you use, while it's true. I'm sure Dick Winnett told you this. Max out over over a, a, a maybe five years, uh, but I don't think about it that way. I think there's always I can find some way to improve, and I think that's how I manage to stay motivated. And it comes back to this regular training to keep at it is the key. But you have to stay motivated to do that, and then you have to stay motivated. You have to change, find ways that you can improve and it's all kind of a it's a wonderful game as far as i'm concerned i love it <laughs> and i love your optimism and i remember that article with uh, richard featured there uh, it was very interesting um 
so what is your I, I heard you say uh, that your current exercise protocol is one strength training session and then an aerobic kind of high intensity interval session uh, per yeah. week w- what is your can you go into detail on what you're currently doing from a resistance training perspective I, I do my resistance training on Tuesday and I do the aerobic training on Saturday and I think that's very important. I think you, when you get older, you need more time to rest. You need a little more time to rest from from uh, from the resistance training than you do from the from the interval training. Um, there's nothing particularly magic about my training. I, it, I it's a whole body workout. I believe in, in a warm up and one hard set. So maybe there's about 13 exercises covering my whole body. Uh, I have two different weight workouts and one that i do at our office we have a full a full weight gym but we also have a setup at home so i one saturday one tuesday i do the workout at the office the next uh, tuesday i do the workout at um, at home and it's a it's a different i have different equipment there so it's different so i'm only doing the same weight workout twice a month uh, and then the Saturday workout is right now is high intensity. I'm doing the the concept to the concept to company made the roller. They also have now something called the ski erg, which is you're, you're pulling down like the, like a cross country skiing, except you're starting with your hands up over your head and pulling it down. So I use I use the the ski erg and the roller. So the, the, those two are, are a wonderful complement to each other because the roller, you're extending your body. The ski, you're, you're contracting your body. So you're getting the muscles in the back of your body with the roller and the, the muscles on your torso and in, in the front. And, and my, my current workout is, I think it's crazy for the, for the, uh, the high intensity, is I do... 30 seconds hard and and about a minute and a half easy and i only do three reps on on the skier and i do the same thing on the roller that's the whole workout but if you do that right and really go all out on those 30 30 seconds i'm not did i say man 30 seconds uh you won't want to do it do it again <laughs> i think it works fine and i keep track the, the the magic thing about the concept two machines is the monitor just a superb monitor where you can you can plug in your your intervals how, how much how much of it the, the 30 second work and and the minute and a half of rest and then it will it will track that and then it will remember it so you can go back to see what you did the last time and and just like with the weight training i try to improve a little bit uh, and when I when I top out, then I I change that ratio a little bit. I might go to a longer one. I might for a while. I maybe start doing just one, maybe 500 reps or one six uh, not reps, but meters. Uh, but that monitor gives you that the, the all important feedback, measuring your progress. And again, progress is what keeps you motivated. So that's that's really not anything very complicated about those workouts there pretty much straightforward and the variety is also helps you stay motivated you're working your muscles from uh, from different angles um, like on the on the uh, on the upper back I do three different exercises there you need to pull down a uh, you need a row um, I, I do the do the Nautilus pullover. I do a a, 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 a lat pull down, mm-hmm. and then I do a, a, a standing row. Three different exercises. That, that's I, the most exercises for any body part is the back, and then for something like the shoulders, I I don't really spend a lot of time on my shoulders because you're working your shoulders when you do your chest and your back. Your back is working your rear deltoid. The, the shoulder, the chest is working your Front deltoids. So I might do one, one, one exercise for the deltoids, and uh, I don't think you need to do any exercises for your bicep and tricep 
but people like to train their biceps. So I, I do one one set of curls. Sometimes I do a tricep push down, but it's, it's nothing very complicated about it. What were you said you do an exercise for your shoulders? Can you elaborate? Like what what one do you often default to? I, I, I do a. a a standing dumbbell upright row hmm. with the dumbbells, not with the barbell, but the dumbbells. And if, and if you control it, pull it up where the dumbbell is ending up just kind of at your shoulder level. It's a wonderful shoulder and, and trap exercise. Um, I do that at the when, I, when I'm doing it at the, the gym at the office and at home. Uh, I, I have Kaiser compression machines where you can adjust the, the resistance by pushing a, a, a button. And I do a seated uh, seated shoulder press that, at home on the Kaiser machine. Okay. Good. So no, thanks for going into detail on some of that stuff. It's just very interesting to understand exactly, you know, what your, you know, what your protocol looks like. Do you... Um, I know you don't rush. I don't, well, I read that you don't rush between exercises. Um, is it one set to failure? Is that the protocol you generally follow? Yes, I, I don't measure like Dick Winnett measures the uh, the, the time for the, the upstroke and the downstroke, and and uh, maybe also the, the time between between sets. I I don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I rest long enough to prepare myself to do the to put all out into the next exercise. Uh, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> no, so, so that's fine. So, was it um, is it single set to failure that you do, or do you do multiple sets? Yes. Yep. Fa failure is is misunderstood. You you think they, they, people think of failure as until you're blue in the face and the bar falls out of your 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 hands. I don't see failure that way. Failure is going to the point where you can't do another rep in good form. And I pretty much know that. If you've been training for a while, you know when you can't do it. Yeah. So I try to continue doing it until uh, and, and, until I I know I can't do another, another rep. I rarely try that rep that I fail because I know when I'm there. And I, I'm trying to do a little more, maybe another rep or a little more, a few pounds more than I did the last time. So I'm trying to move forward. But that's my de training to failure. That's my my definition of training to failure. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Failure is is definitely misunderstood depending on who you talk to. And uh, it can be a dangerous word to use because, like you say, some people can put themselves in very compromised positions if they're... Right, and, it, and, and it's important to enjoy your training. Who the hell wants to go to the gym and, and train to where the bar falls out of your, your blue in the face and the bar falls out of your hands? That doesn't sound very, very welcoming. But what I'm saying, going to the point where you can't do another rep in good form, I mean, that that's kind of a civil way to do it. Uh, and you're trying to improve from time to time, from workout to workout. So uh, it's not... You're not trying to go in there and kill yourself. You're trying to go in there to stimulate your body, to make it adapt. And as you, when you get my age, to you know, to kind of stay where you are and and find other, find different things to do to make it interesting. Clarence, I was wondering, have you read any of um, Brad Schoenfeld's work at all? Are you familiar with him? No. No. Okay, I just wondered because he's um he's a fairly uh, prolific researcher, I suppose now in in terms of looking at the optimal ways to achieve hypertrophy. Um, and I'd just be very interested in your views on his his work because I ended up on the podcast recently. It's a very popular episode, um, but no, never mind. Let's. Uh, <laughs> I just, if you ever if you ever do read his work, um, you know I would be very interested if you ever wrote about it or wrote about your thoughts. I, I, I don't I don't know anything about him. I don't, I don't mean anything uh, offensive, no. but I don't think there's any one best way. Hmm. And and by you know, it, it, by saying that it's basically my way or the highway, uh, that if you have this overload and rest, I think that's the only thing that is un indisputable. 
But these just how you do it. There's many different ways, and that's that's very important because that keeps you training because you can keep changing and realize there's no that there is no magic bullet. The magic bullet is overload and rest. Uh, and if you think about it that way, it just makes it. It just still kind of opens the world up. There are just so many different ways to do it. Uh, you can't just keep doing. You couldn't keep doing the same thing like I have for sixty-five years. You go out of your mind. So but there are the, many different. The principles steps. are the same, though, right? The the basic core principle, yes. Hmm. Because what Brad argues is, um, so he he's very much. Um, it acknowledges that there is no one way um but he is more of an advocate of higher volumes so multiple sets uh multiple you know higher frequency that type of thing which i guess is is different to um to what you what you believe and what you think yes i i wrote and challenge yourself that both volume and high intensity work they both work there's no no disputing that you see the bodybuilders, most of the bodybuilders are still using much higher volume than I do. So that obviously works. Bill Pearl is a volume trainer. Um, but uh, I, I go more towards towards the intensity. But there are, and we have Mike Mincer. Um, and who, who, is, who is the fellow from, from England that won the Mr. Mr. Olympia so many Dorian times. Yates. <laughs> Dorian Yates. He's another high intensity guy. So you have you have Bill Pearl on one side. Uh, of course, you have Frank Zane. He's also a high volume guy. So both of them work. Now, like what I said, there are many different ways to do it. Indeed. Okay. Um, right. Just uh, touch on some steady state uh, question I have here, just very briefly. Um, you know, you've uh, you mentioned you're you're an advocate of doing sort of high intensity interval training, but you you're not into running, from what I understand. Um, is that the case? And if so, what, why is that? Uh, I stopped running a long time ago because it, it hurts my back, and I mm -hmm. this I have this curvature in my back that I mentioned, and I, I did I, I have run, I've done sprints, but it's been a long, probably not for thirty years because it made my back hurt and if something hurts i think you better not do it so i found other ways to uh to to do high intensity to do endurance endurance training the rowing and the skier being two of them uh, other than running so uh, that's why i stopped running i like i enjoy running i wish i could run but my back doesn't like it <laughs> got it um, going back to, you know, you mentioned that you felt you were in your best condition when you were 60. Um, and, and I appreciate you, you, you elaborate on probably your, your lifestyle and training and diet, et cetera, in, in the book around that time that you wrote in that, around that time. Um, but could you share, you know, what, what, were, what did your diet look like when you were in such good condition? So what, what would have been, what, what would a snapshot of a day look like for eating? And does that differ to how you eat now? Well, I think one of the things that allowed me to look so good at 60 was eating a more balanced diet uh, and not being stopped and not I stopped counting calories a long time ago, because if you eat the right kind of to eat the right kind of foods, you, you get full before you overshoot. And then if you're checking your uh, your body weight and your body composition by weighing regularly, you know, if 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 you're getting off, you're, you're gaining fat or something, and you can make an adjustment. So, uh, I think the biggest thing was eating a more balanced diet. But I still didn't know about about the need for good fat, so I still had that to learn. But it was the, it was the balanced diet, less of a restriction on calories. Uh, so free meals a day, I, or, or more and more, 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 more focused on intent intense training and less volume so so was that free, free meals a day or different frequency of eating what was the how many meals would you eat per day and, and that type of thing I, I i outlined that specifically in the challenge yourself book my age 60 book um hmm. and i eat three main meals and for a long time i ate uh, a mid-morning snack 
uh, I, I don't eat the mid-morning snack anymore. But you want it. You want the idea is to eat frequently enough that you can keep your blood sugar on an even keel. If your blood sugar is on an even keel, you're going to be in control of your appetite. So you want to eat frequently enough. So when you come to the next meal, you're hungry, you're ready, but you're not ravenous. You want to come to the meal under control. So I, I generally do have a, a mid-afternoon snack and I have uh, an evening meal. The, my, my biggest meal, you're, you're asking about age 60, I'm talking about now. My biggest meal is breakfast. So you, you start your you start your day full, you're getting your blood sugar up, and then you stay ahead of the hunger curve. Also, I believe in having a bedtime snack. I've been writing about that for a long time. A lot of people say don't you know don't eat anything after six or after seven. I think that's bad psychology. If you if you say you can't eat anything after six, then you want to eat something after six. But if you tell yourself I'm 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 I have a I have a bedtime snack. I know what that's going to be. It's a planned meal. I enjoy it. So I don't I'm not inclined to pick on. Um, eating chips or something all during the course of the evening. So I know what it's going to be. And his main thing is staying in control. And I, I was doing that, the, the meal intervals uh, in Challenge Yourself may have been a little bit different, frankly. I don't remember exactly what it is, but that's the basic idea. And I think I was talking about that, staying ahead of the hunger curve in that Challenge Yourself book. Challenge Yourself is... Uh, a lot, a lot of people, it's their favorite book. Yeah, I'm definitely going to read that one, I think, uh, uh, you know, sometime in the near future. What, um, uh, what, what is that bedtime snack that you're, that you're hinting at? What, what, is, what is your go-to bedtime snack? Well, it has varied, varied from time to time. Um, Laszlo Bensi has taken a lot of my, a lot of my, uh, my photos he took all of the photos in uh in my great expectation book and he has a way with a little section of uh, kind of an afterward in in the back that that he wrote and he talked about my bedtime snack that i had i had bread with with um, one piece of bread one piece of toast whole wheat bread uh, i like sprouted green bread with with peanut butter and jelly and i cut it in four pieces yeah. so it's, uh, you make yourself eat it slowly and he was talking he was talking about that, that that finally that he made his last longer than than i made lot mine last so i felt like that was <laughs> that was a breakthrough but some kind of a snack like that and i probably have some i drink whole milk uh, a little bit of whole milk and my in my bed my bedtime, bedtime snack is still uh something along that line i I, I, I might use almond butter, and instead of putting jam, I might sprinkle some raisins on there, uh, and then have I, another big change I made that I wrote about on the website is the whole milk. That um, that 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 actually whole, people talk about you eat, eat drink whole milk you get fat. That's not true. The, the latest thinking is that that. Um, that skim milk is the processed food. They've taken the fat out, so there's no fat, so it doesn't stay in your stomach. You're more inclined to overeat on drinking skim milk than if you ate, eat, eat whole milk. So, so I, I I have a little whole milk with that evening snack. So it's, the snack has been kind of along that line. It's not a whole big thing, but it's, it's something good. Uh, it has sweet in it, it has fat in it. It fills you up, it gets your carbohydrate, gets your blood sugar up a little bit, which I think allows you to sleep better. What did you have for breakfast today? I had I, I had a sliced hard boiled egg. Uh, I have and people don't like this, but I I I have I have sardines oh, yeah. on the on the top of that. And you can get sardines. I get I get a, a two different kind of sardines. One that um, that is in a, a mustard sauce, and another one it's a Mexican brand, which is in a tomato sauce. So it's not a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, uh, a, 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 a 
whole lot of sardine, but there is some. That's where I'm getting a, a very important omega-3, that, and the fish, fatty fish is the best source of that. And then I have a, 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 a half a cup of a vegetable stew mixture that my wife makes. So I put that on top, and I put that in the microwave, heat it for about a minute and a half. And then while that's happening, I make my what I call my old reliable which is the, 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 the cereal mixture that I started talking about in, in Ripped, but has evolved over, the, over time. So the, the base of that is, is a cup of a mixture of six whole grains. I cook, cook up a batch of whole grains in a, in a, uh, in a rice cooker. So it's six cups and, of, of the, I, six different grains and 18 cups of water. You look at that and you think, there's no way that it can absorb all that water, but it does. <laughs> it shows that it's an example of why whole grains is such such an important kind of basic food because it takes up so much room in your in your stomach, but it's mainly water and it has good nutrients, whole grains. Um, and then I, I have nuts on that, uh, a quarter cup of mixed nuts, which is, uh, almonds, carbohydrate, and, and pecans. I keep we have, keep a uh, a carton of, of that mixture in the refrigerator all the time, and then I have a, a handful of uh, berries, or it could be mixed berries of some kind of fruit, and then I have a, a half cup of water, a half cup of the whole milk. Put that out in the <clears throat> in the microwave for four minutes. And that's my breakfast. That's a huge breakfast. That's massive. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very, it's very sad. I enjoy it. Uh, I've had people come. Uh, we have people come for consultations that they can stay for a day or for two days. Um, and just the thought of that of that sardine. My wife doesn't like sardines either. <laughs> but but. <laughs> And I, I, we had a couple that came from Atlanta here not too long ago, and and, and the guy sat there and looked looked at that, and, and he said, "I'm sorry, but I just cannot eat that." And <laughs> I, I think it kind of annoyed me because I think if he would just try it when it's with the egg and yeah. and the vegetables and and the and the mustard, that he'd find that it really was pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should tell you. I don't, people eat what they don't like anyway that's my breakfast now that sounds so interesting i um i should tell you i had sardines myself this morning so i had sardines with um and and you know like your your uh your your friend or client there you know i i didn't really like the taste of them at first um but i had a guest on called alex fergus who's taught me how to make them really tasty so what i do is i yes. i get the sardines and the olive oil and then I cover them in sea salt and raw raw apple cider vinegar. Yes. Um, and then I cook up, I normally fry two eggs. Um, and then I dip the sardine in the egg yolk. And it tastes great. And it's, you know, it's healthy. So why not? You know, that's, that's a great example because you find a way that, that you like. I, 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 I never eat anything I don't like. There's no reason. There's so many things that I do like. There's no reason to ever eat anything I don't like. But you can just like you figure that out how to make uh, ma- make sardines in a way that you would enjoy. I wish I could get my wife convinced to, to do that. But again, I don't tell her that she should eat what anything she doesn't like either, and she doesn't tell me. But you can figure it out just like you did. That's what I I encourage. Be, use your imagination. Yeah, I, 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 it's a common theme here, which I really like, is that, you know, you've got to find a way to enjoy all these things. If you don't enjoy them, you're not going to be able to sustain a healthy diet or a, a good exercise regimen. Key point, key point, yes. Mm. Which is simple, right? It's kind of common sense, but people are too preoccupied with the notion that for exercise or diet to be effective, it has to be unenjoyable. That's right. It does not, you don't have to eat about one bite of anything you don't like. So, I wondered, uh, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting, Clarence? I mean, intermittent fasting is becoming quite popular. Obviously, it's kind of opposes, or not opposes, but it's 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 very different to what you've been talking about in, in terms of your diet strategy. So, do you think there's any benefits to intermittent fasting? Do you do you ever advocate that? 
there's an article on our website. I, I, we, there's, there's regular articles and then there's facts, frequently asked questions. Hmm. And I think I put the, the intermittent fasting piece on the fact. But we got more feedback on that because I said it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't like the idea. And I just thinking of going for a period of time without eating is revolting to me. It makes me want to eat. My wife is the same way. Just why? Why in the world would you want to to uh, to deprive yourself when you can eat this uh, uh, balanced, healthy diet? Uh, and a lot of people swear by it. They say it, it helps them to control their uh, their uh, calorie intake and that they feel better. There's some argument that it allows your body to repair itself. Yeah, the autophagy better. thing. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, if you believe it, I tell people, both the training and the diet, if, if it makes sense to you, go for it. But it doesn't make sense to me, and I explained why it didn't make sense. And I also have a, uh, a, a, very, a very good piece by a fellow that wrote to me uh, and what the success he'd had and why he thought it was was the way to go. So I have both views there. And, and I, you know, I tell people, you know, if it makes sense, go for it. I explained why to me it did not make sense, and he explained to him why it did make sense. Mm. And then it's up to the readers to decide. I, I like that approach. I don't want anybody telling me um, this is the way to do it. The hell with that. The way to do it is the way that makes sense to me, and I try to be evidence-based. I think that's why my books and my, and my writings and columns have been so successful and not just by anybody but by the professors the, the doctors the lawyers uh, because i i usually cite a study or give a reason or a rationale why it works it's not just do it because i say so which is what a lot of people say and they have tremendous physiques or results and maybe that's enough but it's not enough for me i want to know why and that's the way I I address that address that issue, and you'll find a lot of that on the website. That you know, there's different ways to look at things, and um, you just have to go for what makes sense. But you need, I think, people. You should try to have a reason to understand why you're doing something, and then you'll be more apt to do it than if you just do it because Joe Blow over here said do it. And you don't know why the hell you're doing it, but Joe Blow said do it, so I'm going to do it. Well, that Absolutely. that doesn't work for me. Yeah, I, I love the way you frame your articles. And I think that's so rare today that, you know, you, you always take both sides of the argument and review both, like you say, in a very objective way and then summarize with your own view. And you never try and force anyone down a specific path. And that really comes through in your writing. So, yeah, I think I'm going to... Um, binge devour a lot of your stuff over the next few weeks because i've read a fair amount but there's certainly a lot of articles i haven't read so i'm looking you forward just to re- spend the rest of your life with <laughs> <laughs> well it'll be a life well spent right in some of those categories where i've learned i think that's another thing that people like is that i'm willing to learn if i if i learn something i'm willing to change and i uh, if I find something to change, that's another thing to write about. So I, I like change, but I, I need a reason, and and I'm willing to change. I'm willing to admit I'm wrong, like on the on the fat level. That, but I, everybody else was wrong too, and there's still an argument about how much and what kind of fat you you you, uh, you need. But uh, there's been a lot of argument about that on the on the very from the, by the dietitians that the experts. And uh, to keep up on that, and if things change, you should be willing to change with it. Absolutely, yeah. But know why you changed, not just because Joe Blow said to do it. Yeah, yeah. The fat phobia thing is still really prevalent. It's quite strange, really. Um, yeah, I don't quite know why that's hung around. Maybe it's because the mass media. There's still some. I guess villainized villainization, if that's a word, uh, or demonization of fat. The experts, the medical people, that's what they were saying for decades. Mm. So they got got scared of the game. When when the the, uh, guidelines, dietary guidelines for Americans were first came out, 
uh, and, and had this limitation on on saturated fat. And, and I have a piece where they explained that it, it, it actually was discussed in our in our Congress. Uh, and some famous senator, I forget what his name was, but this fellow was testifying that the doctor and said they should delay a little more until they really had all of the all of the facts on that. And, and the senator said, well, uh, that, that he wasn't in a position to wait, that they had to make a decision now. And it's turned out now that uh, that, that that saturated fats apparently are not associated with heart disease. Mm. A diet is, I think, and maybe may some kind of, of saturated fats, but saturated fats that are in whole food, the way that it comes in in the food, and we're not doctored or, or um, probably an important part of your diet. I've got a lot of stuff on fat on in the diet and nutrition category. A lot of really interesting things happening there. Hmm, absolutely. Do you take any supplements at all? I take a low dose multivitamin, hmm. and I've kind of changed over the years. I I, I do not push supplements. Um, I also take a uh, two. Uh, fish oil capsules. Uh, there's a, the s- studies indicate that that the capsules are not as beneficial to you. The, the fish oil is not as beneficial as eating the whole fat because they don't really know just exactly what it is that that is so important. Mm. Uh, but when I go to the Cooper Clinic, which is in Dallas, Texas, and they claim to be the world leader in preventive medicine and i believe it's true i've been going there for 29 years uh, and and they measure these they there's a measurement now about you can measure the omega-3 in your blood uh, and they want you to be on a scale i think above eight um i don't know eight what but it's eight and my doctor, his name is Lynn McFarland, he's just a wonderful guy. He's been following me for years. And and he said, said about 80% of the people that come there are deficient in omega-3. Mm-hmm. And and I had a really good good score there when I was eating the fish and the and the, the, the fish oil cap. And but when I stopped the fish oil cap, my, my reading went down a little bit. So I, I eat the fish, and then I have the two capsules, which make my reading go up a little bit. Whether that makes any difference or not, I don't know. But I, I just like having the better reading. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've um, So I've had a, um, a blood test done where it's checked the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. I think that's similar yep. to what you're talking about. And, um, yep. you know, it's frightening because a lot of people have that ratio way out. Um, and I think the, the normal or the, the what's considered healthy um, by a lot of these organizations is four, four to one um, from omega-6 to omega-3. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Clarence, on that. Um, it, it is something like that. And the, yeah. the thing is that almost nobody is short on omega-6. So you don't need to worry about that. It's when you're reading a balanced diet. Where they are short on is on the omega-3. So right. you do that by eating the the um, sardines and any kind of fish. The, the, the doctors tell you to have sardines a couple of times a week. I have it every day, but I don't have a whole lot. I just a little bit in that breakfast. I don't know how much it is. Maybe it's a couple of ounces. Um, but that that has worked for me, and I, I enjoy it. I like it so. And I still have my my omega three in the blood reading is just right up there, top notch. And of course, I like that. The Cooper Clinic has measured a lot of things that have have been have been helpful to me. I wouldn't have known about this the the my, my triglycerides being cut in half when I added the vegetable oil. If I hadn't been going there and having it measured on a regular basis. Excellent. How often do you get it? Get those sort of checks done now? How regularly? I go about every eighteen months. Okay. Uh, they, they would like you to go for for um, every year. I, it, it's interesting that I had read about uh, the Cooper Clinic in Runner's World, um, so, so I I knew about it. Uh, what's the famous? Doctor, he's a, kind of the philosopher of 
of running that is very famous. Uh, well, Ken, Ken, Kenneth Cooper? Is it Kenneth? No, Cooper is, is, the, is the head of the Cooper Clinic. But in a way, this fellow had written about about the Cooper Clinic. Oh. And the Cooper, and this, this doctor, he's a, he was a, a, a hard doctor. And, and, and Dr. Cooper found his... Uh, that he had prostate cancer, and which eventually killed him. But anyway, I had heard about the, the Cooper Clinic, so I got a call from Arnie Jensen, who was a doctor at the Cooper Clinic, and invited me to come over. Uh, and I knew about the Cooper Clinic because I read about it in Warner's World magazine, so that was, that was an important development. And he actually came over and visited us and spent a couple of days with us to tell us about the Cooper Clinic and to convince me to come. And so, and then I came and I went for, I don't know, about 10 years. He never charged me a penny, <laughs> and, but they charge a lot. So when, when he finally left, I found what a, how, what a big, good deal I was getting because I, I found what I had to pay for it myself. It was kind of a different ball game. So that's why instead of going every year, I generally go over 18 months. But I think that's about right. And that kind of spreads the cost over over time. So anyway, it's been very good for me. I've learned a, a lot of things by, by going there. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that you go a lot more frequent than that. So that's really interesting that you, you go every... Because I suppose it's like weighing yourself. You can get a little obsessive with measuring yes, you know, yes. those, those yes. things. Mm. Yeah, I noticed when I had my Omega-6, Omega-3 ratio measured that... Um, this is quite a while. Uh, this is over six months ago now that I, I had been eating great um, and my, my ratio was 10 to 1 or something. Um, mm-hmm. Which is still... Sorry? I, so I, yes, yeah. that's high. Yes, uh, which is <laughs> next to get your attention that if you weren't having to measure, you'd never know. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Because you hear so many people say, "Oh, I, you know, I'm going to do this," or "I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm at this, I'm in this position." But you're like, "Well, are you? How are you quantifying that? How are you measuring that? You know?" Um, and I do think it's really, really valuable information. It's worth the worth the investment. And I use um, I use Live Smart. And there's other organisations. There's Twenty Three and Me, and obviously you can just go to your your local doctors, depending on what country you live in, um, and uh, and you know get this get this in, get this data, which is very useful. Um, the, the, the Cooper Clinic mm. measures these things, and interestingly, they do not tell me how to exercise or how to eat, <laughs> because they see what these results are and they say. <laughs> You know, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So I think, in some ways, I'm a little ahead of them on this, on this, uh, on the dietary fat. For one thing, they don't recommend. They still um, oh, really? recommend restricting the the, uh, the saturated fat and, and some things, and also skim milk instead of whole milk. But the doctor, my doctor, Doctor McFarland, does not argue with me about that. And I, I explained why I did it and the studies and all of that. And yeah. and he said, you know, as long as you're getting these results, it's fine with me. But but that's that's the, the, the key thing there is they find things in my in my book, Great Expectations. I there's a there's a chapter in there where I talk about my hip replacement, but I also talk about a bladder problem that I had where I was retaining uh, urine and I would have never known that if if they hadn't found that at the Cooper Clinic. Um, so I, I tell about how I got that fixed and my go around with the urologist and some of that. And but the point being that when you're going to a doctor, you need to help him help you, but also realize that that you're the decider. He can tell you, you know, what he thinks you should do, but you're the one that needs to decide. And the doctor and I had some disagreements there, and I, I kind of explained that. But this, this doctor turned out to be an excellent surgeon, and he fixed my problem to where I've never, never had that problem again. And I, I, and I did not have an enlarged prostate. I just I had what they call kissing lobes, which apparently were on the where my where my uh, 
where the urethra goes into the into the bladder there. But I removed that, and I've been fine ever since. So uh, it, was, it was a positive, good end result, but I think it was helpful. And I, my wife said, you know, why in the heck do you want to write about that? <laughs> so it made me think about it. So I started that section out with a section about why I why I want to tell you about this. And, and the key thing there was that you shouldn't just be doing things because the doctor tells you if you don't, you need to understand it. You need to cooperate with the doctor. You need to help him. No doctor can exercise for you. No doctor can eat well for you. A lot of them are not very good in either one of those categories. But he can help you explain what's what's wrong and what uh, what you should do and explain why. So understand why and help him. He can have, Nobody can help you like you can help yourself. Well said. So in, in terms of health, fitness and nutrition, what have you changed your mind about in the last year? I know there's obviously you've, you've spoken about a few things already, like whole milk. But w- what else have you changed your mind about in the last year in that area? You know, that's pretty much it. The fat level and, and the whole milk, mm. the uh, the importance of omega-3. And that's been, you know, that's been something that's been that's been changing. Uh those are the two. I, I pretty much had diet right in, in ripped. I talked about eating eating foods the way they come in nature, whole foods. And uh, I say there, if you eat the whole foods, that you won't have to count calories, and uh, and you'll you'll, uh, you'll you'll never get fat. And what about the, if you're if you're trying to if you're trying to uh, maximize muscle gain? Do you? Because I find for myself, if I just eat till I'm full, I can eat I can eat very little, um, and I th- and I don't. For me personally, I don't seem to put on muscle mass if I just kind of revert to, you know, my letting appetite regulate my eating. So, what do you say but in that? But if you include a, a high quality protein in every meal. Mm. You're you're going to have enough and have enough protein. I get mine from eggs. The highest quality protein is from 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 milk and eggs, and and uh, and the sardines, of course, too. So I make a point to have some high quality protein in every meal. And your body can only digest, can utilize only so much protein, and and if you overshoot there, your body just sluts it off or it also can, can cause your kidneys to be over uh, overworked so i don't i i don't see any need to take in, uh, protein supplements i think you can get all the protein your body can 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 use as long as you make a point to have some high quality which is generally an animal fat animal protein um, high quality protein in each meal and i make it a point to do that but it, it's eggs, milk, fish. Got it. So do you, when you say you're drinking whole milk, are you, is it raw milk as well? Is it raw whole milk? Am I getting that right? Or what type of milk? Because I want to know the details. So if I try it, I want to know I'm drinking the right thing. No, it's not raw milk. I did drink raw milk for a long time until my, my father was a medical doctor and, uh, of course, there's the problem is that that can be contaminated. You don't know just whether the dairy is doing things properly. So I, it is it is pasteurized. I, it's organic whole milk pasteurized that I drink. Because if it's pasteurized, it's heated, right? So that it preserves it for longer. Does that not kill a lot of the goodness in the milk, though? Well, <laughs> I guess that's a matter of uh, there's a dispute. Uh-huh. But that there, there, there might be more danger. Uh, we were getting the uh, in ripped, the first printings of ripped. I talk about eating uh, the raw milk, uh, and we were getting it at a doc at a dairy that's been here forever. And I don't think there was much. I think that was a good dairy, um, and I think that was all right. But general, generally, you just can't be sure that. Uh, that you're not going to get some kind of bad actor in in uh, you know in whole milk. So unless you know exactly where it's coming from, it's better to drink the the uh, the pasteurized milk, and that's what I drink. 
Got it. Um, we're coming towards the end of the, the show and uh, I want to be respectful of your time, Clarence. Um, is there any last piece of advice that you'd love to share with the audience from all your, all your learnings? Well, I think I pretty much, I think we pretty much covered it. I think this <laughs> idea of the, of the importance of regular training and how you stay motivated, trying to improve, making an interesting change all of that, we've, we pretty much covered it. I, all the really key messages, I think, we've, we've talked about. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. I, I, I agree. I think, uh, I think you're right. I think we did cover it, and I'm really, really pleased um, to, to have done so. Um, and, you know, likewise, Clarence, it's an absolute honor to, to have you on the show. Um, how can people find out more about you? Where should we send them? Well, our website, it's very easy. It's just CBAS. They, they, they want to spell it clearance instead of clearance. <laughs> so just C-B-A-S-S dot com. Uh, we'll take you to our website. If you want to just Google it, if you can't remember the website, just type in Clarence Bass, uh, and you'll be surprised how much comes up on Clarence Bass. Uh, and our our email address is there on the website. It's also pretty easy to remember. So we, we, we I don't take very many phone calls because I'd spend all day long on the telephone, but I do try to answer all of my emails. So uh, people are welcome to, to email it, email us. Uh, and our books, there, we, can, we have 10 books and three DVDs and are the main things, and you can get our books. And probably the easiest way uh, in the UK where you are is to buy the books on Amazon. Um, the advantage of buying them directly from us is I will autograph it. Uh, some people really want that, and they're willing to pay the extra shipping. The shipping costs have gotten higher and higher over the years. So those are the two things, the website and the email excellent and no social media none required no i uh, <laughs> told that i should be on facebook and, and uh, twitter and all of that but Nonsense. I, I really don't want to spend my time that way i've gone that i uh, my energy is is used up writing our the the, the articles for our web web on uh, weekly monthly updates there's usually about four different things there it takes time to do that because they're all researched and edited uh, and i don't think people want to know what i'm doing every minute of the day <laughs> and so I, you'd be surprised i don't have, have so much energy and I, I try to put it where i think it will have the most effect and it may have hurt me to not be on on facebook i don't know but it just does not appeal to me no i, I don't think it's her you um my, my most up-to-date view on that is that you know you're, you're putting out great content at the end of the day and if you're putting out great work people are going to share it and that's all that matters i think i just think social media can be a distraction sometimes um so i don't think you've got anything to worry about there clarence um so to all those listening i implore you to check out clarence's website um and obviously i have links to all of the things you've mentioned all of the books and articles uh, on the show notes so if you like this episode please subscribe and then send it to someone you love and who you really want to help because i think clarence has shared some information here that is timeless and incredibly effective um so i implore you to do that and then take a second to leave a review to find all the show notes of this episode and all of the episodes go to 15 minutes corporate warrior.com forward slash podcast and uh, that is it so clarence it's been a, a huge honor thank you so much for taking the time this podcast is brought to you by hituni.com hit uni are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications hit uni comes highly recommended by the best in the field including body by science author dr doug mcguff discover strength ceo luke carlson and trainer drew bay it was founded by my friend author and longtime personal trainer simon shawcross simon has 15 years experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high intensity training workouts Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, and Dr. Ellington Darden, HIT Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. 
The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing and the courses are really easy to follow and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention that there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regimen. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, that's hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10. Thank you for your support. 